continuing where we left off last week. Okay, last week we talked about spiritual growth. Okay, if something is not growing, it is dying. Right? Okay, because there is no such thing as stagnation. It's either going forward or going backward. Right? If you look at plant life, for example, right? You can see the different seasons of growth, right? So we are talking about growth. Are we growing spiritually? Okay? And this growth is measured with God's standard, not our standard, not some sort of an interpretation that we get from Scripture and we think that, oh, this is what God wants. No. We want to look at all the things that what God wants, what God expects and how he measures us growing spiritually. Are we growing or are we backsliding? Okay. Are we, you know, are we going backwards? Are we going forwards? Or are we going backwards? And that's what we are doing, especially as we are coming to the closing of this year. We want to know where we are. Amen. So let's look again the same scripture we looked at, right? Psalms 1 1. It says, Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful, but delights in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. <clears throat> right? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in its season whose leaves shall not wither, whatever he does, he prospers. Amen? So if you are planted in the Lord, it doesn't matter what season. You go from one season to another, right? You are either growing or you are fruiting. Come on, right? You are growing or you are fruiting, okay? God is either putting all the essentials within you to bring forth fruit, right? <clears throat> all the essentials or you are bearing fruit, right? You are bearing fruit. So you are going from one season to another. But the key component in this passage of scripture is that he says here in verse 2, right? Delights in the law of the Lord. <clears throat> Delights, loves the word of God, right? I, I don't consider people who look at the Word of God once a week people who love the Word of God. Okay? Absolutely not. People who love something can't wait to go back to it, right? So he delights the Word. And then this is the key component we want to talk about today. And he meditates day and night, right? Meditates on the word day and night. So he's saying something here that's very important. The process of this growth, right, is triggered by this aspect called meditation, right? As we meditate on this word is when we begin to grow, right? So the word meditate here means moan, growl, or make noise. Right? That means we moan when we listen to a scripture. We don't let it go. You know, as I was studying this passage of scripture, studying the word of God, you know, for the last three days, you know, I have just been looking at these passages again and again and again and again, just looking at them, meditating. And then once in a while, you know, as I look at a passage, it comes alive. As it comes alive, you know, I begin to say, whoa, that's, that's some good stuff. You know, and then suddenly it begins to open up. And suddenly the Lord uses that word as I begin to meditate. And he says, now you can take that and apply it into your life. See, the word is a seed. As you take that seed and as you begin to germinate it, what happens, right? Our physical body feeds on physical food. Our spirit man feeds on the word of God. So you cannot grow your spiritual man without feeding on the word of God. Without nourishing, right? Without chewing, without, right? encountering different levels of the word of God. Let's go on further here. John 15, right, verse 1 to verse 7. 
Jesus is talking about also a tree here. He says you cannot bear fruit unless you abide in me, right? A branch cannot bear fruit, right? Unless it abides in me. Neither, right? It has to be connected to him, right? He says that if it does not abide, guess what? He says it will wither and it will throw it into the fire. It's not talking about unbelievers. It's talking to believers because why unbelievers are not connected to him believers are connected to him so he's saying when you wither you are chopped off right so it's our job to maintain that connection circumstance don't change that connection right the connection is determined by us so here the word is the word that's used abiding okay abiding and meditating is very interesting why because one aspect of abiding, the Greek word for the word abiding is the word hypomeno, right? Hypomeno, the word meno, okay, has this implication of remaining, remaining, right? Or holding on in a meditative state, right? God gives you a promise, you don't let it go until you see the promise coming to pass, right? What the world says is immaterial. What the medical world says is immaterial. What God says stands forever. Amen. So here we see the similar connection. Let's go a little bit further now. Meditation also means mutter. Okay, this word here, mutter. The word mutter here implies a process of digestion. Okay, how do we digest food? We have to crunch it, break down the food. Right, break it down as it goes into the stomach. Stomach acids are begin to release, and what does it do? It goes through the small intestines, and one of the things the intestine does, it removes the nutrients. Why? The body wants the nutrients, and it eliminates the junk. Right? It eliminates the junk. Right? It draws the nutrient. So what happened? The food is converted into molecular form. Why? Because it has to be converted so that it can become part of you. Okay? You become the food and the food becomes you. The food gets into your system and guess what? It just dissolves within you. Right? And now suddenly because you've ate that food, you got energy. Right? In the same way, it's God's word. But the process here is the word matter. Right? That means we hold on to that word. We begin to think about that word. We begin to speak that word. We begin to study that word. That's why you see, coming along just Sunday listening, no benefit. No benefit. It's just an encouragement. It's just a push to you. You have to go and digest it. You have to go and, and investigate it. You have to go and think about it deeper and deeper and begin to process it. Why? Because this word now has to be digested into your spirit. Okay? Most of the time, if I were to ask you, what did you hear on Sunday? Okay? By the time you walk out of the church door, you already forgot half the message. Okay? By the time you hit the food court, the rest is gone. The only thing that's left is the one that you like. Okay? You like. Not what God wants, but what you like. This is our human nature. Right? Why? Because we did not connect with the word in the spirit. We connected in the word through our mind. Right? We did not come so that the word would change us, but we came to examine the word. Let's see what benefit I can get. What vitamin, what Thing encourages me. What makes me laugh? What makes me smile? What makes me happy? What affirms me? You know, today is so bad. Many people go to church just for affirmation. They think they are at an Anthony Robbins seminar. Unfortunately, you are not. You are at a place where God is developing you to become a spiritual giant. Hallelujah. God is nurturing you. God is building you. God is strengthening you. God is not spoon feeding you. Amen. So somehow when we speak of the word of God, the natural body, both the soul and the spirit are involved as the energy is released. It brings change to our soul and it brings strength to our spirit. 
See, as the word of God is being digested, you know, that's why, you know, when you sit in church, you know, you sit silently, you're not getting anything, right? That's why I always encourage people, wherever you are sitting, wherever you are listening to the word of God, say amen. That's it, amen. I agree with that word. Why? Because God doesn't understand that silent, mm, he doesn't understand, amen? You must come into that agreement. So Matthew 12, 36 says what? Let no idle word, right? Idle word that men speak. They will give account on it on the day of judgment. Your words, okay, will be justified, okay, or your words will be condemned, okay? Your own words will affect the results of your life. Your own words, right? Right? You don't throw, you know, you don't throw up because somebody ate something, right? You throw up because you ate something. You vomit because you ate something bad. Similarly, right? Right? The words that come out of your mouth, either they will justify you or they will condemn you. Either they affirm you, right? That's why God doesn't like gossipers. Right? God doesn't like backbiters. Why? Because those words are going to condemn you. Right? If you need to justify, if you need to backbite, that means what? Obviously you are wrong. Come on. Right? You just keep silent. Right? You keep silent. Right? Allow God to justify you. Matthew 12, 33 says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He says, guess what? You know all this, uh, the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures, but guess what? There's no fruit in your life. There's no fruit. Right? So he's confronting the Pharisees. He says, how can being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things things look at what he says right where does the fruit come from right the fruit comes from your heart right where does the tree begin to produce the tree begins to produce whatever it's supposed to produce because of what is on the inside of that tree the nutrients of the inside of the tree, the sustenance on the inside of the tree. So here Jesus is saying, the words on your lip okay, are a reflection of your heart. In order for you to succeed, those words must be based on God's word. Right? Based on God's word. The word must be put on your mouth and in your heart. He's rebuking the Pharisee. Why? Because they say nice things. There's some people who say very nice things, okay? But guess what? What are they saying behind you? <laughs> right? It's not what they say out of their mouth, but it's what they're thinking in their heart. Jesus is going back to a tree. Why? Because he's talking about producing fruit. Come on. A spiritually growing Christian produces fruit. There is fruitfulness. Amen. Right? Fruitfulness. So let's go further here. Joshua 1 8 says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written. It will make your way prosper and you will have good success. Look at that. Meditate again. Mutter. He, he pushes it further. He pushes it further. He says, Meditate day. And night, day and night, right? Day and night. Why? Why is he saying meditate on it day and night? Because the word of God is a cleansing agent. Cleansing. John 15, 3 says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Right? Pure and clean. The word needs to purify you. You see, you cannot grow in God if there is no purification. Just by listening to the word of God and just coming to a meeting does not change you. The word of God needs to go deeper into the recesses of your heart. That word needs to change your heart, needs to change your lifestyle. And here it's interesting.
interesting because the same word that is used okay, for the word pure and the word clean is the same Greek word. Same Greek word. So here in blessed, Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Same word. Blessed are those who have a clean heart. They shall see God. See? Why we cannot encounter God? Why is there a block? Why is there no growth? Guess what? Heart's not clean. Heart has not been washed by the word of God and by the blood of Jesus. What does meditation do? Meditation brings about a cleansing. See, you listen to the word, here you choose. What do you want to listen to? No. What meditation says? Remember that word that was spoken? That's talking about you. Remember that word that was spoken? That's talking about you. So what does meditation do? It takes it deeper. Okay? God cannot push it down your throat, but you have to allow it to take it deeper. That's why when you listen to a message, you're going to keep listening to it. You're going to keep listening. No one time. You're going to listen to it several times. Why? So that it will get into the depth. Some things that you didn't get the first time, you'll get a second time. Okay, I listen to theologians all the time. Sometimes it's very difficult as you begin to listen to some of the concepts they are sharing. But you know what? I listen to them 20 times. I listen to them 30 times. I listen to them 40 times. Why? Because I want to get what they are saying. What is this deep truth that they are saying? Why? Because unless I get it, it will have no effect. Okay? No effect. In my heart, if my heart's not changed, guess what? There's no encounter. I'm not growing. Why am I not growing? Because I'm not getting closer to the source of life. Remember, God's life, light, and love. If the life of God does not come inside of you, the light of God cannot lead you to the next place. And if the light of God cannot lead you to the next place, guess what? The love of God you cannot encounter. All you have is superficial love. Some people say, oh yeah, I have the love of God. You know what? Most of it is selfish love. Why? Because the love of God is a different type of love. The love of God causes you to serve others. Go beyond. Don't think about yourself. Okay? Not think about just my needs or my thoughts. Okay? Sometimes when you talk to some people, all they talk about is themselves. Themselves. Why? Because they've never truly experienced the love of God. Right? So here it says, right, in the process of meditation, you are being cleansed so that you can go closer. Without being cleansed, you cannot go closer. Without going closer, you cannot grow. Why? Because the source of life comes from God. It comes from God. Hallelujah. Let's go on quickly, right? When we are purified, we can see God clearer and clearer. Whatever part of your life that is purified, that part begins to reflect the image of God. Whatever part, right? Scripture here is not talking about seeing Him, right? With your eyes. But rather here it's talking about seeing Him with your heart. Heart. That's why when your heart is sensitive... Right? To God in worship, it's very easy, right? To worship in tears. Why? Because your heart is pliable. Right? So here the scripture says what? Look at what the scripture says. Second Corinthians 3 18. We've seen the scripture many, many times. I've seen it thousands of times, right? Unveil faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. If the veil is not removed, the glory doesn't come. Look at that. The veil needs to be removed so that the glory can come. And look at where the veil is. Right? The veil, the scripture says what? The veil is in our mind and the same veil where? It's also in our heart. Right? The veil was removed in Christ. When we received Christ, what did Christ do? He removed that veil. He cut our rizzo is the Greek word, which means he purified our heart. Okay, so here, what is the scripture talking about? Unveil means, what does it mean, unveil? That means Christ did his part by removing that veil, but we need to begin to unveil our hearts towards him. Our mind is unveiled. But the question,
Christian is, is our heart unveiled. It is easy to unveil a mind because it's just a thought process. But it's difficult to unveil a heart. Why? Because a heart is where now you don't just come to agreement in your thought, but you come to agreement in your expression. God wants you to take it further. We're talking about growing here. So the word of God comes inside of you. Christ has removed the veil from your mind. The Bible says what well, the, the God of this world has put a veil in your minds. And now Christ has removed that veil. Right? But guess where? We need to remove that veil. Because the Bible says what? The pure in heart shall see God. So when you lose purity, guess what happens? The veil comes back. The veil is there. That's why you can't see God. I've seen people who are backsliding. Oh, I can't experience God anymore. You know, I, I used to feel God all the time as if it's God's fault. As if it's God who backslid. Come on. God didn't move. You move. God did not change his heart. You change your heart. Right? God is not the one who walked away from you. You walked away from him. You did not maintain. You did not keep that harmony. You did not keep that sustenance. You did not keep that life flowing. Why? As that life flows, the light will begin to flow. Amen. When the light begins to flow, the revelation begins to flow. I'm telling you, you will not move. Because revelation stirs you, sets you on fire when you refuse to move. You know, I used to minister to all sorts of people. Okay? Now I'm selective. I minister to people that are hungry for God. Hungry. That are desperate for God. Those are the people that I want to minister to. Hallelujah. Not people that, you know, just want another message, but people who want change, right? So here in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God commanded light to shine out of darkness. It shone where? In our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Right? So when the light shines, what do we see? We see revelation. Where is this revelation? The revelation is in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay? Let's explain this. Let's kind of break it down to understand it. Right? So here it says, beholding as in a mirror. Okay? They could not get a Greek English word to explain this terminology. So they put a bunch of words here. Beholding as in a mirror. The original is just the word mirroring. Okay? Mirroring. They couldn't use that word. Right? So what did they do? They put a bunch of words. Beholding as in a mirror. Right? What is mirroring? Let's explain. Let's break this down. Okay? We with unveiled faces mirroring the glory of the Lord. We are the mirror. The glory shines upon our heart. That's how we see the Lord. Right? So what happens? Okay? We begin to meditate on God's word. As we begin to meditate on God's word, guess what? Right? As we meditate on God's word, that light of the glory of God begins to shine on that meditation. Now we begin to see, oh, this is who God is. Okay, this is who God is. You know, the other day I was reading an article and it says that when you break down the chromosomes of the DNA, okay, interesting, that, that when the DNA chromosomes are bro broken down, okay, they say that the, the breakdown of the DNA is spelled the word Yahweh. I said, what? The word Yahweh is intricately, okay, in our human DNA. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It's so powerful inside our human DNA. So what does it do? Right? When that revelation comes, now you get so excited and now you begin to glow with that light. So what happens, right? The light of Jesus is shining on you. And now as you are receiving this light, you are reflecting that same Jesus glory back upwards. What does that mean, right? Means when that revelation comes, when that understanding comes, okay, look at it this way. When it comes, it now produces a reflection. It does not 
not just produce an understanding, but it produces a reflection. Why? Because as you understand that this God is a magnificent God, this God is a powerful God, immediately you realize that, you know what, if my God is so powerful, I'm not worried about sickness and disease. Okay? If my God is so powerful, I'm not worried about COVID-19. I'm not worried about any more variants that are coming. Let them come. It doesn't change anything because in the name of Jesus, all those variants have no power over me. This is the reflection now. You see? Because now, you are looking at the glory of God and this is what you are saying. You are beholding this revelation in a mirror. Now you are reflecting it. In your life. Why? Because your wrong thinking, your doubts, your fear, your worries disappear. Hallelujah. Let me explain it another way. Right? A telescope. Right? They have a Hubble telescope. And now they have a new telescopes out there in outer space. Okay? One of the things about a telescope is that before they, you know, before you can see anything, that glass has to become pure. Polished and polished and polished until that glass can receive that image. You see what I'm saying? That nothing wrong with the image. It is the glass that needs to contain that image. Nothing wrong with who God is. But it is our heart that is unable to reflect who He is because our heart is darkened. You see? So what do we need to do? We need to cleanse and cleanse and cleanse our heart with the substance of the Word of God. The only thing that can cleanse your heart is the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is the standard. Not your standard. <laughs> Not your standard. Okay? Not your example. So what do you need to do? You say, I'm not receiving. I'm not understanding what God is saying. That means your heart's corrupt. Your heart's polluted. Your heart's got too much debris. Your heart has too much cobwebs. It's got too much. Have you seen a mirror? Sometimes you take a shower, you come, what happened to the mirror? It's got fog on it. Right? There's a bunch of fog. Why? Because your heart is not cleansed. Unless your heart is cleansed. Look at this. Why I'm saying this is so important. Unless your heart is cleansed, you will not grow. Because you are unable to see Jesus in the light of who he is. You are unable to see the word of God in the light of what it is. So why do you need change? I'm good. I'm good. Why do I need to change? Right? I don't need to change. He needs to change. Someone else needs to change. I don't need to change. No. Okay? God's goal is you. The word of God it should be applied to you. Right? So the more you walk with God, the more the image becomes purified and clearer. Notice that? As the glass is being polished and polished and polished. See, one of the things they have done with the Hubble telescopes and the other telescopes that they have out in outer space right now. Okay? They are, they are so modified and they are so in pristine condition. Why? Because of the images that are coming back. They have never been able to see deep space like what they are seeing today. Why? Because that glass is pure, clean, with nothing on it. Right? So we cannot grow unless our heart is purified. Ephesians 3.16 puts it this way. Right? That he might grant you according to the richness of his glory, be strengthened by the spirit in the inner man. God is going after the inner man. Why? Because if the inner man is not changed. Look at verse 17. Why? If the inner man is not changed, Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. So, when the inner man is not changed, guess what happens? There's no dwelling. No dwelling. Only visiting. Right? Visit. Jesus visit. One Sunday, once every Sunday. Okay? Six days, nothing. No visitation. Right? You, you need to strengthen. The word here is dunamis. 
the power of the spirit needs to be allowed to work on the inner man so that the dwelling can increase. Notice this. When the dwelling increases, the faith increases. Why do people have doubt? They have doubt because the dwelling did not increase. Nothing wrong with the word. Right? Okay? Many people have many Bibles at home. No use. You can put it under your pillow. That's nothing. That word needs to become life-giving. It needs to come inside of you just like food. Right? That word through the Spirit of God as you meditate, you think about it, you process it, you hold on to it, you study it, you go deeper and deeper. What happens? The Spirit takes it and makes it mingle inside of you. Makes you one. Okay, you know, you can see change. You can see change when the word of God takes effect inside of you. You know, you can see the change. You know what? The things that you used to doubt, never, you don't doubt anymore. The things you need to, used to fear, you don't fear anymore. The things that used to worry you, don't worry anymore. They don't cause you to worry anymore. Why? Because the word of God taking effect. Right? The word of God is taking effect. Okay, if you have any press panic button, what panic, panic, SOS, SOS. What have got no effect? No growth. No growth. Okay, the image of God is not superimposed. The life of God has not permeated on the inside of you. Because it's not permeated on the inside of you, guess what? It's still you. It's still you. The inner man is receiving layer after layer of the life of God. So we are talking about spiritual growth. We are talking about the inner man growing into the image of Christ. Amen. The image of Christ. This is what God wants. So God needs the material on the inside of our inner man to change us. God needs that material. Do you know that? Right? God needs that material. What's that material? Repentance, brokenness, contrite spirit, teachability, hunger, desperation. Right? God needs those spiritual materials so that he can bring that change on the inside of you. Okay? Our inner man. Must become stronger and stronger. When he becomes stronger and stronger, Christ becomes bigger and bigger. Hallelujah. Christ dwelling in our hearts is the same proportion of his image being clear in us. If you say, I cannot encounter God, you know why? Because the heart cannot pick up the image. The heart is not receiving spiritual input. No input, no output, right? The more you walk with God, the more the image becomes purified and clearer. Jesus said what? My words make you clean, right? The word from God needs to remain in you till the image is forming you, right? What do we do sometimes? We like go. I'm tired of changing. I don't want to change anymore. I don't want to go that route. What's your option B? There's no B, right? There's no alternative. Is there an alternative besides God? There is no alternative. God, okay? God is the only source of life. In Romans 8, 20, 8, 29, right? Look at what it says. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What is God's goal? God's goal is to conform us to the image of Jesus. That the image of Jesus becomes clearer, 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 right? You don't hold on to all these things on the outside. You hold on. So the longer you live, guess what? You hold on longer to Jesus. You hold on more to Jesus, right? Maybe you used to trust and hold on to people. No, you don't. Don't waste your time, right? Bible says he that trusted a man is like a shrub in a desert. Okay, Jeremiah 17, 5. That's what it says, right? But he that trusted God, amen, is planted by the rivers of water, right? Conform God's goal is that this image is being formed on the inside of us. It's going here, right? Galatians 2, 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me, right? Question, how much Christ lives in us? 
How much of this image is growing in us? How much of this image is growing in us? How does Christ become a part of us? Okay, there are two processes. How Christ becomes a part of us. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight, every sin that ensnares us, and let's run, right? With endurance, the race that is set before us, right? So he says what? Number one is the word, lay aside sin, push back everything that holds us back, See, unless we choose to change, we can't grow. Okay, unless we cut off that sin nature, unless we are deliberate, guess what? We cannot be part of that race. So here he uses the word endurance. Okay, interesting. Because that word endurance has that same meaning as abiding. When I say I endure, means I hold on. I hold on. Right? Okay? When I, when I cleanse myself, somehow now I can hold on. Notice that? When I wash myself, now I can hold on. Right? I can hold on. Okay? Every snare. That means every trickery. Every deception. Right? You can begin to hold on till the process begins to work in you. That's why meditation is so important. Why? See, you cannot just look at a word and just put it aside. One month later, look at it. It won't have no effect. It will have no effect. Right? You gotta hold on, think about it, and see. Listen to what God is saying to you regarding that word. Hold on till the process begins to work inside you. Okay, Paul uses the word here, and the word race is the word agon, which is a fight. It's a fight to hold on. Okay, it's not a simple thing to hold on, but you gotta, you know, in the original Greek, what he's basically saying, holding on to holding on. Right? You keep holding on. Right? The first part of meditation is that the word begins to start working in you. It begins to start working in you. You begin to see, okay? You begin to see the word taking effect. You begin to see that growth process happening. Right? There's a change. In your nature. There's a change in your character. There's a change in your belief system. There's a change. You do not doubt so much. You do not question so much. But you believe. Right? You do not compromise. You say God's word. As it is. You don't sugarcoat it. Today there's so much sugarcoated preaching. You know that? People want to make people feel good when they come to church. That's not our goal. We want to see growth, not feel good. Hallelujah. Amen. Number two part of the process, it says that as we look unto Jesus, okay, now the effects of the meditation not just changes you on the inside, but begins to come out of you. See, there's two parts. Okay. Heaven is, you know, heaven is not just a place, but heaven is also a state of being. Right? You are going to heaven, but heaven has also come on the inside of you. When you experience Christ, heaven has already come on the inside of you. But heaven is also a place you are heading towards. You can experience heaven on earth. Right? So your goal is what? To synchronize so that, you know, heaven does not just come on the inside of you. But you are also experiencing heaven every day. So let's look at this second word, the same aspect, but in a different angle, right? Psalms 119, verse 15. I will meditate on your precept and contemplate your ways. Look at that. He says, now I'm meditating, but because of my meditation, there now comes contemplation. What is contemplation? It means momentum. That meditation now begins to increase momentum in my life. Right? It begins to bring forth the fruit that God wants to see. Not words. Words is cheap. Amen. Words is a starting point. But God wants to see action. 
when we begin to meditate, now your ways begin to step. Okay? Your steps begin to align. Right? Verse 148 says, My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. He's saying, I'm thinking about your word all night. Right? Not thinking about my problem, not thinking about my challenge, not thinking about my worries, not thinking about the things that concern me tomorrow, but I'm thinking about your word. Because the key is your word. The solution is your word. Notice that. The second level, your heart begins to awaken and you begin to sense God and become aware of His presence. Now working not just in you, but through you. Okay? The, as the present comes in you, the presence is also going out of you. Okay? Okay? In the spirit world, okay, gravity is what you create. In the spirit world, momentum is what you create. Right? Hallelujah! Right? Okay? If you stay, if your state of being is being pulled towards heaven, guess what? Your heart will also be pulled towards heaven. If your desires are being pulled towards heaven, your heart will also be pulled towards heaven. Right? In the spirit, there is no distance. There is no distance. Right? Okay? In the spirit world, time dimension has been Remove. It's completely removed. Right? Ephesians 2, 5 says, Even when we are dead in trespasses, He made us alive in Christ and raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The first part of the process is where God works within you and eliminates your fear, eliminates your worry, eliminates your burden, eliminates your confusion and begins to bring about that cleansing in your heart so that now you are firmly footed in your trust on who God is. That's the first part of the process. Okay? Out of that, no doubt comes out of you. No fear comes out of you. No concern comes out of you. Why? Because you are firm-footed on who God is. It has established you. It has strengthened you. Right? It has undergirded you. This is the first part that shows that you are growing. You don't go backwards. Okay? I don't understand when people say, Oh, here they have backslidden. How do you, how do you backslide? Right? You have fallen away. Right? So the second part, what it's saying here, right, is not that, not about that change that came inside of you so that you can see this reflection of Jesus, but in the second part, you become the reflection of Jesus. Right? Time and space is removed in your life. This is so powerful. Time and space is eliminated in your life. So that's why Paul is saying that I'm a life in Christ, right? I'm here, but I'm also there. I'm here as I am fighting here, I am winning there, right? I'm in both places. I'm in both places. Look at this. So the growth that God wants to see is that as you are growing here, your influence is growing there. Hallelujah. As your influence is growing here, guess what? Your impact is growing there in heaven. That's why the longer you walk with God, you don't have to pray the same way you used to pray. Right? When you were a baby Christian, tolong na God. Hello, tolong. God, help. Help, please, please, please. No need. Right? That's a baby Christian. As you grow in God, I'm telling you, you can come to the place. I'm telling you, you pray in the Spirit. And at the end of praying in the Spirit, you just say, thank you, Lord. You know. You know. I don't have to utter it. You know. Why? Because your thoughts have synchronized with God's thoughts. Your heart has synchronized with God's heart. 
So you don't have to get up in the morning. God, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. You don't need. Why? Because it's alignment. Alignment. There's no distance in the spirit. There's no space in the spirit. This is a second level where God wants us to grow and come into. Because when we come to this place, I am telling you, you will become such an instrument in the hands of the Almighty God. Now let me give you examples in conclusion. I'm going to give you three examples of this process. I'm going to show you how these three things break down. Right? One part of meditation is changing you. Right? Ephesians 3.16 says, strengthens you with power in the inner man. Second part of meditation is presence coming out of you. Raised up. Right? As the image is being formed in you, you grow into an unlimited capacity in the presence of God. Nobody can stop the limit of your growth. The only thing that can stop the limitation of your growth is yourself. No one else. Okay? As you pray in the spirit, you could, you know, you can have out-of-body experience. You can, you can have supernatural encounters that are unlimited. So now let me break these three things down and let's figure out which stage we are at. Let's break it down, right? Three levels of God's impact in one's life as we begin to grow. Isaiah 40, 31 talks about these three levels. He says, those who wait on the Lord, right, shall renew their strength. And then he says, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So here he's giving us three levels where people are at in their growth. Three levels, okay? Psalms 144 verse 1 says, Blessed be Jehovah my rock, who teaches my hands to war, my fingers to fight or to battle. Right? God equips us to win. He teaches us to win. He shows us how to win. Then he enables us to win. Right? So let's look at the first level where many people are at. Okay? It says walk and not faint. Interesting. Walk and not faint. Here the word faint means feeble, idle, lazy, lack of stamina, disheartened, lose heart. Right? Right? Very sien. Some people say, I'm so sien. Right? Very sien. Right? They're just walking. 1 Samuel 30 verse 21 says, right? It says, we are told 200 of David's men were faint. They could not follow David because they were faint-hearted. Hosea 12 4 says, yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel and spoke with him there. This is talking about the first level. This guy called Jacob in the Old Testament. Remember? Right? What was Jacob's problem? His entire life. What was his problem? Identity crisis. Inner struggle. Okay? Inner struggle. Interesting. This passage says what? Right? They found him in battle. He had to get to battle to get his breakthrough. Right? Some people will never get their breakthrough. You know why? They can't even come to church. <laughs> They can't even come to the conduit that can help them. Come on, they, can, they think they, you know, they can do it on their own. You can't do it on your own. You need the fellowship of believers to strengthen you, right? And to come there. So here, what we notice, he confronted the angel for favor. Why did he get, how did he get there? Yeah? He didn't get there because he was seeking God. He got there because he went into a personal crisis. This is what we call a crisis Christian. Crisis. Right? Many professing Christian, okay, lacks them in a... Why? Because there's a, they're idle. They faint. They lose heart. They falter. They lack stamina. This is a picture. Right? 2 Corinthians 4, 15, 16 says what? Right? Abundant grace to thanksgiving for which cause 
We faint not. Though our outer man perish, our inward man is being renewed. So what does God do? God allows a shaking on the outer man. Why? Because he wants to see transformation on the inside. God allows a crisis to bring forth a breakthrough. Okay? Remember, meditation first is what? It's to cleanse you on the inside. Okay? There's nothing, there's nothing phenomenal about Jacob. I'm telling you. Okay? There's no mighty works. Have you ever read any mighty works of Jacob? Right? Right? Imagine if Jacob gives a description about himself. So Jacob, what is the greatest thing you've achieved in your life? Oh yeah, I got four wives. You got one, I got four. What a joke. Right? Can you imagine? Oh, so share us a little bit more about your life. Yeah, I stole food from my brother. Ran away from home. Married four wives. God rescued me and I'm here. Wow. That's not a testimony. That's ouch. It's a bad testimony. Right? So, this is that first level. Walk faith. Walk faith. Walk faith. Walk faith. Right? The only change that came was what? He decided to confront himself. Okay? He had to purify himself. The first level. Okay, what happened? God changed his name. Why? He had to change his name to change his identity. Without getting a breakthrough in his identity, he could not grow. You know that? Jacob could not grow. What do you see in the life story of Jacob? Struggle after struggle. Everywhere he go, right? Bad things happen. Bad things happen. Everywhere bad. Can you imagine marriage night? Right? The beautiful girl in the veil opened the veil. I yo, not the girl, it's her sister. Nightmare. Can you imagine? What a joke. Right? Open the veil. Wow. I want to see the bride that I love. And then you open the veil, you go, ah! Right? Oh my goodness. Right? Then what? His father in law tried to cheat him. Nothing, nothing. Everything is bad, bad, bad. Right at the end, he's running. Why is he now wanting to get a hold of an angel? Because his brother is coming for his neck. His brother is coming for his neck. Not that he wanted to see God. The guy never got it. Right? But the goodness of God changed his identity. God said, you know what? If I don't change this guy's identity, this is a hopeless case. This is a case of no breakthrough. You know, sometimes when we talk about the prevailing prayer, when you encounter the angel, we give this description like this. Jacob was this bombastic guy. He had no other option. God had eliminated every other option. Okay, come on. Are we crisis Christian? Okay. Are we crisis Christian? This is the first level. We are changed into sons of God. First level, second, it says run and not be weary. The word weary is impatient, right? Jeremiah 12, 5 says, if you run with footmen and they weary you, how can you run with horses? We are called to run. Notice the first one was walking, the second one is running. First Corinthians 9, 24, Paul says we are all running in a race. Notice it never says we are walking in a race. We are running. So what is this description? This second character now is in participation. He's catching the wind and the momentum of the spirit. He's not like the first guy that's just walking, but he's now in the race. He's in the race, right? He says, run in such a way that you will obtain. Okay? Don't run haphazardly. Don't run without a goal. Don't run without an agenda. Isn't that interesting? Right? We cannot grow without an agenda. Imagine a kid says, you know what? This year, I'm not going to go to school. Okay? Secondary three, going to go sec four. I will choose not to go to school next year. At the end of the year, I want to walk up for the certificate presenting ceremony, right? Guess what? Nothing will happen, right? Why? Because there was no aim. There was no goal. There was no involvement. There was no participation. In this second level, there needs a participation so that you can synchronize a greater presence of God. 
You can bring about a greater revelation of God. You can bring about a greater unveiling okay, of the glory of God in your life. See this? Second level. Same example I used last week. Genesis 14, 7, right? What is Abraham doing? He's going from one battle to another battle. Right? These were not battles that, you know, necessarily God called him into. Some of them were battles because one of them he was going to rescue his nephew. Remember, he was rescuing Lord. So he's going from one battle into another battle. Here he is in momentum, not like Jacob who was in crisis, he is in momentum. Because now he is in momentum, participating, guess what? The Bible says he encounters a theophany of Jesus. Melchizedek is a theophany of Jesus. In between the races, in between the fighting, Melchizedek comes with a cup and bread. Melchizedek comes and reveals to him, Abraham, you are not winning because you are fighting. You are winning because Jesus won 2,000 years from now. It's future for Abraham. Remember? For us, it is past. But for Abraham, it's future. He's reminding Abraham, you already won. Why? Because Jesus' victory can go backwards. It can go forward. Right? It can pay back backwards. It can pay back forward. Hallelujah. Amen. This is what he's describing. What is he doing? He's refreshing him between two battles. Okay. What's the difference? The first one, you have to do all the fighting. You have to do all the repenting. Until you come to a place of repentance, until you come to a place of change, you can't encounter God. In this second one, because you are in the race, guess what? God is walking in the race with you. <laughs> He's with you. Can you imagine? After the battle, Melchizedek appears and says, Come on, Abraham, let me refresh you before you get into the next battle. Because you are going from glory to glory, from victory to victory, from faith to faith. Hallelujah. Let me refresh you. Okay, God taught me something several years ago. Some things you can stop, but some things you have to go through. Okay? You have to go through. Why? Because in the process of going through, he is transforming you. See, notice this. In this aspect, there's a different measure of the glory. The first one, it says an angel was before him. Here is a king priest. Right? Melchizedek. Why is this important? Right? This is important. Right? Because the closer you go, Right? Your encounter changes. Right? Because his engagement changes. Hebrews 7, 17 says, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. See, we are not called into the Aaronic priesthood. We are called into the Melchizedek priesthood. Okay? Abraham here is not dealing with personal issues. Okay? He's in the thick of a battle. He's fighting for the life of someone else. He's fighting, okay, for his nephew. He encounters a theophany. We are called to be priests, right? Because we are grafted in Calvary. In the second level of encounter, what happens, right? As you go through this process okay, of growth, what does God do? He brings new revelation. He brings new understanding of what? Of what he has done. Now Abraham looks at the cup and the body and he says, you know what? It's already done for me. He's now rest assured that the next battle has already been won. Just like the last one. So Melchizedek indirectly is telling him, Abraham, don't worry about the next battle. You just have to participate in it, but you have already won. You just have to go through it, but you have already won. Why? Because now the growth that is in you is at a different level. See? A lot of people have superficial growth. And then they say, yeah, God has promised me. God will do this. God will do that. And then next day die. Mati. And then they say, how come God didn't go through? God, how come God didn't come through? God cannot come through until he go through. Come on. He has to go through you. 
and that he can come through you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at that. Right? He has to work in you before he can come through you. So you can pray, Lord, I stop this, I stop that. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. You cannot get a hold of that victory. You cannot get a hold of that breakthrough. Right? Because the life of God has not become the light of God. It has to become the light of God. You have to move to the second level. The second level of revelation. The second level of understanding. The second level of transformation. You are not an observer. Now you are a participant. Okay? You're not dealing with personal issues. But now you are in a thick of a battle where God placed you in. You are not struggling with personal crisis or identity crisis or, or issues with yourself. But now you are focused on nations, cities, kings. He's fighting kings. This is a different place. Right? Do not, do not deduce the place where God's called you to. You see, where if you are constantly just dealing with your own things, own problem, own things, own things. Guess what? No growth. No growth. There's no growth. There's no maturity. There's no sustenance. That means the life is not, if the life cannot sustain you, how can it come through you? If the life cannot work in you, how can the life break through you? Hallelujah. Amen. So at this second level, he encounters the kingship. Right? He encounters the priests. Now, what does Melchizedek? What does Abraham do? Right? He brings an offering. He contributes. He puts a seed at the second level. Notice that he, he's part of the fight. He's part of the giving. Right? He's part. He's part of the whole process. To come to the second level. Run and not be weary. Hallelujah. Let's look at the third level. Mount up with wings as eagles. It means the word mount up means ascend above your boundary. You go to the high place where you begin to see what is going on. You become aware of what is going on. Joshua, right? Chapter 1 verse 1. Right? All the way to verse 2. He says, Now it came to pass after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now therefore arise, cross the Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place the sole of your feet shall tread, I give it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. Right? Now this this. Joshua receives his assignment from God himself. Joshua is about to face the greatest battle Israel has ever faced. He's facing walls that are insurmountable. They have just crossed the Jordan River, right? As they have crossed the Jordan River, what has happened is that the enemies of Israel are paralyzed. Why? Because they heard about this army. This army is a different army. This is an army where even the rivers part. As they step foot in the river, their presence brings a parting. Can you imagine how fearful those enemies were? Right? So Joshua... Now, when he nears the town of Jericho, the Bible says in Joshua 5 and 13, he looks up and he sees a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you a friend or are you a foe? Verse 14, neither one. This is what that commander of the army says. Are you for us or are you against us? He says, I'm... Neither for you, neither am I against you. 
He says, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Joshua fell at his face on the ground in reverence. And I am, I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? And he says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. Look at that. This is a different level of encounter. The first level of encounter that Jacob had, he was struggling with his inner self, his identity, his personal issues, and the breakthrough he got was sonship. The second level was where Abraham was going from battle to battle and he was being refreshed and recharged and re-energized so that he can be focused from one battle to another battle so that he can run and not be weary. But in this third instance, okay, the angel says, this is not your battle, but this is the Lord's battle. You see, the eagle... When it sees its eaglets in danger, it will scoop down at lightning speed and instantaneously rescue its eaglets. Instantaneously. The first one, he had to fight the battle all by himself. The second one, God was in partnership in the middle of the battle. But in this one, God says, you sit back and watch because the battle... It's not even yours. It is my battle. It is my battle. And so it is my. It is my battle. But it becomes your victory. Your victory. Look at that. Different. Why? Because as you read the book of Joshua, you will notice a few days before that, what did Joshua do? They were at Gilgal. They circumcise. They prepare themselves. They align themselves for this visitation. The issue of sin was eliminated. The issue of personal issues were eliminated. It was not a battle that they were fighting for their nephew or rescuing their cousin. But now he's moved into another level. The highest level. This was the Lord's battle. The highest level is not about your identity. It's not about a rescue mission. But it is the assignment of heaven. Psalms 2.8 says, Ask of me and I will give you nations for your inheritance. The ends of the earth for your possession. Acts 19.17 says, When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were seized. With fear. And they held the name of the Lord Jesus in high honor. Fear fell on the city of Ephesus. Because of the presence of Jesus on the apostles. You see, this is the third level. The early church walked so close with God. That the fear of God came wherever they went. Look at what God tells Joshua. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous and you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to give to their fathers. Your issue is no longer with people. But your focus is now to take back what belongs to God. To bring people back to the place that God has assigned for them. Bring people back to the kingship authority of God in their life. Hallelujah. Where are we today? Struggling with identity? From one rescue mission to another? Or on God's assignment? 
He's calling us to grow into sonship. He's calling us to grow into the Melchizedek priesthood. He's calling us as a kingdom of priests and king. I pray that you and I can grow to the place where we're not concerned with bread butter issues. We're not bothered with people issues. But we are focused 100% on the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. That we become a reflection that as we begin to grow in the things of God, as we begin to hold on to the promises of God, we are transformed on the inside. And the life of God, the light of God, and the love of God begins to draw many thousands and thousands come into salvation because you are not just speaking the word you are not just living the word but you have become the living word the word has become flesh and I tell you that if you and I come to that place nothing will defeat us nothing will shake us nothing will falter us but you go from glory to glory from faith to faith, nation to nation, people group to people group, two sickles in your hand, and you will bring a mighty harvest, fruit that you will bring to the Father in heaven. It's not money. It's not your positions. It's not your titles. It is not your buildings. But it's your life. The Bible says, a corn of wheat, unless it falls in the ground and dies, it abides alone. But when it dies, it brings forth fruit and fruit more abundantly. D.L. Moody said the world is yet to see what God can do with a man or a woman that is completely consecrated unto him. And he said I want to be that I pray that that's your prayer. I pray that that's your heartbeat, that that's your passion. I want to be that man. I want to be conformed to no human image, but to the one image, the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The Son of the living God. Paul says, forgetting those things behind, I press forward to comprehend Him, to lay a hold of Him as He has laid a hold of me. Keep laying a hold. Keep going after Jesus. Keep grabbing a hold of Jesus until 
He grabs a hold of you. He holds you in his embrace. And nothing else matters anymore. Let 2022 become the greatest year of your existence. As darkness becomes thicker, there's one promise. The light will become brighter. And this light is on the inside of you. Your assignment is to make this light become brighter. Brighter and brighter. John Wesley said, I want to set myself on fire and let the world come and watch me burn. Hallelujah. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, beautiful Father, gracious Father, how can we reject such a great salvation? How can we reject such a great redemption. Lord, our hearts are full. Our hearts are lifted by your word. Strengthened by your spirit. Surrounded by your love. Thank you, Father. A million lives will not be sufficient. To show you gratitude of what you have done for this wretched old sinner. Father, we pray today as we come to you, we surrender. We lift our hands, but most of all, we lift our hearts. Transform us. Change us. Realign us. That the Jesus we preach is the Jesus we reflect is the Jesus we declare and is the Jesus we possess as he possesses us we pray in this next two weeks we will align ourselves we will scrutinize ourselves. We will allow the Holy Spirit to bring a fresh impartation, a new sense of cohesiveness, Lord, a togetherness, a oneness, so that we will step into a new place, a new atmosphere, a new sense of victory, a new understanding of glory and a new possession of your presence. Father, we pray that the greatest days of our life is ahead of us. What you have done behind us, we thank you for what you are going to do ahead of us is unlimited in capacity and we surrender to you wholeheartedly and we say father come change align empower and use us for your glory in jesus name we thank you father Thank you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you for participating. Once again, share this message. I believe many people will be blessed by this message. Share it, right, as many times as you can. And I may not get to wish you, but I want to wish every one of you that are watching tonight a blessed Christmas season. Yes, the world has commercialized it. So what? 
Amen. Jesus came to this world to save sinners. Amen. So let's preach the Christmas message. Let's enjoy our families and friends. Let's celebrate. Let's reach out to the drown trodden. Let's bless those people. And I also want to thank all of those of you who contributed last week. There was a thousand two hundred that was contributed. Six hundred went to Nepal and six hundred went to Pakistan to take care of the widows and bless those orphans. And I believe that blessing will come back to every single one of you that bless those widows and orphans. Have a blessed Christmas and a wonderful new year that is to come in Jesus name. God bless you. Thank you for your precious time. Amen.